Thanks so much, Gaute and Anton, for having me today. And um, and uh, I just want to say that you know, for a long time, my group's been working on questions around model reproducibility, model sharing, model validation. And of course, today with the theme of this workshop, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about um, model validation. And I especially want to thank the previous speaker for setting up so many aspects of what I'm going to be talking about. So um, I had a slide about um, models as hypotheses and, and how important it is to think about um, you know, how, how we think about what are the best models. And I took that out because of time. So now I'm, I'm great. You know, I don't have to worry about that introduction. Okay, so um, talking about uh, model validation, um, basically the premise that we're starting from in our group is that as models become more complex, when we think about rigorous model development, um, you know, model fitting, model optimization, when we think about rigorous model evaluation, where we, we want to um, be able to um, continuously validate models against data as new data are obtained, or as we decide that there um, should be additional ways to evaluate models, similar to what James was talking about with brain score, we want to have a very... Um, you know, a, a rigorous way of doing this. And so I think a lot of us, when we think about the ways that people have been validating models, um, you know, in the past, um, it's quite informal. Sometimes it's rather inaccessible. So we might talk about how we fit a model or how we evaluate models in a paper, but it's not exactly clear what all the tests are, exactly what um, kind of model analysis, what kind of data analysis we use to compare models to data. And so our goal really is to make this um, entire process more formal, more transparent, um, and therefore more reproducible. So if people want to use, for example, the same kinds of tests to evaluate different kinds of models, we want them to be able to reuse those tests. And like I said, we want this process to be continuous. Um, if you're going to be reusing models, especially as they become more and more complex and you don't wanna start from scratch, you wanna reuse models, say from the Allen Institute or something like that, you might want to um, continuously update those models, continuously evaluate those models um, you know, into the future. So um, the approach that we have for this is basically thinking about testing models as being something like unit testing. So you decide what kind of tests you want for um, evaluating fitness of models in optimization or for evaluating models during validation. And um, you know, those tests, what those tests are would depend on exactly what field you are. So we saw a great introduction to this in the last talk, um, talking about different ways of evaluating models. And um, you know, I just wanna point out, you know, you could think about ways to evaluate synaptic models, um, uh, evaluations based on spike timing or spike statistics, evaluations of um, network um, features like frequency, um, even evaluations of extracellular potential, evaluations of behavior. Um, and you'll see a few examples of this later in the talk. So, different communities will have different ideas about what these tests should be. Um, and what we wanted to do is set up an infrastructure um, where communities could decide on tests, but then could um, share them and reuse them. And so that's the idea behind SciUnit. Um, you can find more information about SciUnit at SciUnit.io. Um, and what I want to stress is SciUnit is, is um, just a basic framework for setting up workflows to do model validation and, um, and also you know, visualize results um, and things like that. And um, SciUnit doesn't care what kind of model it is. It doesn't even have to be a neuroscience model. And so it's just a basic framework for doing this. So SciUnit enables um, reproducible execution and visualization of validation tests. Um, and then the intention is that within different communities, there will be these domain specific implementations where you decide on what kind of um, tests are needed, exactly how you're gonna compare models to data, whether they're quantitative, qualitative, you know, you can decide on all these things. So right now there are over 30 different um, repositories at GitHub. 
that include libraries, specific libraries developed in different parts of the community that are based on SciUnit. And so a, a few of those are, um, are shown here. I just wanna point out that they go from um, test repositories for looking at synapses to looking at uh, single neuron models to looking at network models. Um, for instance, there's a there's a network unit that comes out of the Human Brain Project, where they've developed these test repositories in the libraries to use them, um, to apply them to large scale network models. Um, and then there are others that are specific to different brain regions. So, for example, um, there's one you know focused on cerebellum. There's one focused on hippocampus. You get the idea. So, different communities might decide that they have. Um, different kinds of evaluations that they want to make on models, and they can get together and decide what those benchmarks should be and develop these um, test repositories, these libraries that can be used with SciUnit as the, the kind of um, the, the basis for the, for the test flows. So I think this fits in really well to um, what Anton mentioned earlier today about the fact that we need test suites as benchmarks. And James brought up the same thing, right? Coming up with benchmarks for, um, for the, um, the vision models that he's looking at. Okay, so we also have um, SciDash recognizing that once you've done this testing, um, it's nice to have a place where you can share the results, where you can share um, these sort of updated results of what my models are, what tests I used, what were the scores for those tests? So this is this idea is very similar to what we saw in the last talk where James was showing um, their, their, um, their brain score application. All right, so um, just to focus on a couple of examples, my group, I mean, our group, I should say, um, has only been involved in developing two of these test repositories. One of them is called Neuron Unit and one is based on the Open Worm Project. And so I'll just men mention those a little bit because these are the ones that I know the most about, and I think they're a good example of what kinds of things you can do. So, um, for example, with Neuron Unit, the focus of Neuron Unit is on um, single neuron models and ion channel models. Um, the tests can be generated um, somewhat automatically from data already from, for instance, neuroelectro.org, the Allen Brain Institute, the Blue Brain Project data, um, project within your own lab. You know, we have workflows set up for doing that. It's fully NeuroML 2.0 compliant, meaning that um, if you're gonna run a lot of tests, it helps if your models are standardized. So either you need to sort of focus on um, a, a smaller community where um, you know, it's easy to run a lot of models at once um, or try to use standardizations for models um, where, mo where models are shared in some standardized format, which it makes, makes it quite easy to run a lot of different simulations, to control the um, parameters that you're going to use in simulations, to control the simulation parameters and that sort of thing. So that's where NeuroML, um, which is a standard for um, describing and sharing models in neuroscience, can make testing easier, can make validation easier. Right now, Neuron Unit um, Libraries supports using Neuron as your uh, simulation environment. Um, and sorry, my mouse is very finicky. Uh, so it supports Neuron and it also supports JNeuroML, um, which is sort of a nice way of running NeuroML models very easily. Um, there's also support for NeuroConstruct, uh, which is a model development platform that um, some people use in the biologically realistic you know, modeling community. Um, it supports parallel test execution, which is important if you want to use this framework for parameter optimization, which I'm going to show you an example of this in a minute. Um, so just as you can use these, you know, you can develop these specific tests, you can use them in model validation, you can use the same tests in model um, optimization. You just use those tests as your way of determining model fitness as you're trying to optimize the model against experimental data. And so we have a setup for doing that for, for um, that's, that's um, at the moment works with neuron unit, but in principle you could use with other repositories. Um, so in this case, as I said, neuron unit is focused on experimental properties of cells and ion channels. But as I said, there are many other libraries out there for folk, you know, that focus on other kinds of models. 
It has neuroscience gateway integration, which is great for optimization and Docker containers for reproducible testing. And so all of this is just sort of an example of what you can do with one of these libraries. And then you can imagine building libraries with um, these sort of benchmark test suites that you could use in different communities where each community decides which tests are um, the most important for their community. Okay, so here's an example of what you might see at SciDash. Um, if you, um, you know, upload test results there and want to share them with the community, for example, this is just an, ex this is, this example focuses on a single mitral cell model um, from the Migliori lab, where it was run against some, you know, basic membrane property tests. Um, and, um, and then the scores are shared here. And I guess the important thing about this is if you, if you click on one of these tests, um, the transparency comes with the fact that the dashboard shares exactly what the model is that was run, what the, um, the instance of that model, in other words, what parameters were used for the simulations for that test. And it also shares uh, what data were used um, to compare two model results. So in this particular example, the data were taken from neuroelectrode and, uh, sorry, neuroelectrode.org. And, um, and it says here what the values were for this, you know, AP amplitude test, for example. All right, and so I wanna show a simple ex example of how you might use something like this in um, model optimiza optimization as well as uh, validation. All right, so this example just focuses on a relatively simple neural model, um, the Itzikevich model. And um, you know, here are the equations uh, here on the left. It has uh, 10 or 11 parameters that um, can be set to um, get vastly different kinds of uh, sort of spiking behavior out of the model. So let's say that we set these parameters and we, we simulate the model. And, we, and then um, as an example, um, what I want to do is sort of start from, you know, random parameters. Um, and I believe in this example, we're fitting five parameters at once. So for five of these parameters, we, um, you know, change them to just sort of random values. And we decided that we would try to optimize the model to fit this reference simulation and the optimization criteria are on the right. So these are the things that we're going to test to um, decide whether our model is good or not, right? So we're just trying to reproduce this particular model. This is so, of course, that we, we, we know what the answer is. <laughs> All right, so our goal is to recover this waveform. Um, and um, the little cube here is just focusing on three of the parameters that we're going to fit uh, as an illustration. And so, you know, if we were to think about A, B, and K as parameters that we want to, you know, we want to find the, uh, we want to fit them, um, then we're looking for, you know, a particular uh, parameter value for all of those values, plus two more um, to produce this, um, this waveform. All right, so the setup that we have right now, um, there, there are a couple of things, um, you know, a couple of ways of doing this in the SciUnit framework. Um, we have a genetic, just sort of a basic genetic algorithm uh, approach. We also have a link to um, Blue Pi Opt, which is a um, optimization approach out of the Blue Brain project, um, which is you know just a little bit more specific. And we've tried a couple of different things. So um, you know there are other options in terms of um, you know exactly what kind of algorithm you want to use to do the optimization. But the point here is that these um, neuron unit tests are the tests that you use for evaluating fitness and everything else just kind of wraps around that. All right, so this is just so showing, we start here at the top with generations of models with very high error. And as we go through further generations in the genetic algorithm, we get toward models with um, low error that, that satisfy our criteria. And so we go from a score matrix on the left for a few different models where um, they, there's quite a bit of error acro across the um, tests. The tests are listed here kind of on the X axis. Those are the tests. And then the scores are color coded, uh, normalized to this sort of uh, color code to say, you know, whether 
the model performed well or poorly. And so what we see is we start at, you know, pretty poor scores across the tasks that are looking at model fitness. And um, as we transition, uh, we get to scores that are, you know, that are pretty good. All right. And so, for example, we were able to recover this waveform um, and the and the green here is the um, is the result that we wanted, and the blue is the result that we got after optimization. And not that many generations, right? Okay, so you get the idea of how you can use this sort of framework to do optimization as well. And um, and I think that you know obviously the 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 goal here would be, or why would you want to use this this sort of optimization with maybe a SciUnit test repository um, as your, as your uh, tests. And the whole point is then you could very easily share, these are the exact tests that we did for model fitness um, during optimization. So you could share that easily, say with a publication. And then you could also link to um, the data that were used you know, to compare to. All right, and so one more um, example here. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a relatively simple model, especially compared to the model that we heard about in the last talk. Um, but I want to show it because it, um, I think it illustrates how these kind of test repos repositories can be used in, um, in a, to look at multi-scale models. So you can use different kinds of tests at different levels, but still have a general framework um, where you're not sort of ad hoc putting together a bunch of different, you know, different approaches. So for those of you who don't know, the Open Worm Project is um, kind of an open science project. You can find them on the web um, where um, it's community driven and the idea is to come up with a model for um, everything having to do with C. elegans. And so there's a model, for instance, for um, the, uh, the, 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 the neurons, the network of neurons um, in the nervous system of the worm. There is, uh, you know, additional models for, um, for the muscles in the worm and, and then behave, you can see behavioral outputs, see how the worm moves. And um, so the idea was that in um, putting together these different models, this community is using these um, psi unit based tests, they have a test repository of tests that they can use at the different levels of models in the Open Worm project. So for example, um, there are tests for um, looking at um, channel behavior, like you see in the upper left corner, tests for cell behaviors, like you see on the right side, and then tests for um, movement behaviors, which you can see in the bottom left corner. So, you know, again, the idea is just you can have these repositories of tests that are quite different, keep them well organized, always be able to update them. As the model is continuously updated, um, you can uh, you know, rerun the test quite easily and quite automatically. And again, you know, um, because of this sort of dashboard approach, you can share these test results at, you know, somewhere like SciDash. We certainly recognize that communities might wanna have their own dashboards you know, sort of like what we saw for brain score um, that, um, you know, are very flexible and meet the needs of that community. But just for generic tests, if you want to use SciDash to share your results. So for example, you could share all your test results and then, um, you know, uh, set it up. You, you're able to set it up so that you have a URL that you could share in a publication, for example, so that other people could go and see your test results and see exactly what tests you used and what data you use. So that's sort of the advantage of doing something like this. It's very, it you know, adds a lot of transparency to sharing information about model validation. All right. So of course, all of this work um, relies. A, you know, we couldn't have done this a decade ago. Um, what really is important is having this ecosystem of tools, right? So there's all this stuff behind the scenes. We need to be able to access data. We need, you know, APIs to get these data um, from publicly available resources. We need, um, you know, sort of standardized um, data analysis workflows, like the kind of thing that you could get from, say, um, 
um, you know, neural ensemble, some, some, of, some of their um, things like um, NEO. Um, you need, um, you know, to be able to have standardized models, stan standards for data. You know, that's a whole nother thing. We could have a whole nother talk about how if you want to automate this process, you need to be able to access this data through APIs, but they also need to be standardized so that, um, you know, when you're writing these tests, you can access the data in a format where you understand it and you can easily compare it to outputs from your model. Similarly, it's really important to have standards like Neuromal and Sonata so that when you um, are you know, grabbing models from model sharing platforms like Neuromel DB or, or Model DB or you know, wherever, you need to be able to run those models um, you know, with, without a lot of fuss. You'd really like it to be automated so that you can run a bunch of models at once and grab a lot of data and do these comparisons in an automated way. So um, it's really important that these, a lot of these resources are now becoming very mature and have APIs and have standardizations um, so that we can do this. All right, so um, I just want to thank uh, Rick and Cyrus, who were the ones who uh, first started the SciUnit project. Um, Rick uh, Gherkin is a collaborator of mine at ASU. We sort of run a lab together. And so we've continued to work on this, you know, moving forward. Justice and Russell um, uh, were students in our lab who worked on various parts of this. Russell mostly worked on optimization. Justice worked on a lot of testing of the framework, using it to um, analyze, uh, uh, using it to validate um, and optimize and validate models in uh, of olfactory bulb. And then Treejoy, um, you know, he is um, a powerhouse behind a lot of cool things that are going on, but he um, is one of the um, developers of Neuron, um, sorry, Neuroelectro, and also contributed to some of the early approaches for SciUnit. And then Steven Larson and the Metacell group contributed to um, just general testing and um, collaboration on OpenWorm. And I'll be happy to uh, take any questions that you have.